असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मा अम आई सेलेक्टेड आर देर स्टिल सम पीपल कमिंग इन या लिट कमिंग कम कम द सब्जेक्ट दैट आई सेलेक्टेड फॉर दिस टॉक इज अ लिटल आउट ऑफ द वे but it's connected to santa barbara i mean santa barbara is sort of responsible for it <laughs> <laughs> emptiness it's uh, entirely to do with buddhism and a particular brand of buddhism tibetan buddhist philosophy why i came to this subject is the beautiful bookshop that you see there uh, i hope you've visited it and if you haven't i strongly recommend it if you just want a wonderfully wonderful selection curated selection i'm looking at the curator anyway so uh, curated selection of books on um, several aspects of spirituality and philosophy that's the go to place um especially buddhism it's a lovely collection and i i think half my collection on buddhism is from here from tibetan buddhism from from this bookshop and if you just want to go sit quietly get in some good vibes or meditate that's a very good place to go to actually my interest in this subject um started quite some time back when i became a monk uh, that was about um, how many 30 years ago now so as a novice uh, monk i in our training center in our main monastery in india on the bank of the ganges i came across the name nagarjuna for the first time i came across his works the mula madhyama kakarika vigraha vyavartini i came across the terms um, emptiness it's an english translation of the sanskrit shunyata means emptiness the void and i was fascinated i mean who wouldn't be it sounds it sounds cool as americans would say but what does it mean and that started a long journey over nearly three decades where um, i wanted to understand it in terms of uh, advaita vedanta which is the sub, which is the philosophy that i am familiar with which is uh, the philosophy that we have here in the vedanta society um which was the philosophy uh, that i was learning as a young monk in the monastery there it seemed this uh, concept of emptiness seemed in some ways uh, eerily uh, you know it felt familiar and yet felt very different also so it uh, so it was very very fascinating i kept on studying reading by myself sort of getting uh, reading whatever i could get my hands on i remember one of the early books which really influenced me was the central philosophy of buddhism by t r v murthy he was a very well known professor of indian philosophy um which took this nagarjuna's philosophy as being the central philosophy of buddhism and nagarjuna's philosophy starts off with uh, the famous silence of the buddha so it seems that the buddha whenever he is asked these final ultimate questions of philosophy you know is there a self or there's no self what happens after uh, after you attain nirvana you know you attain nirvana so what happens after that when the buddha's body will go away so where does the buddha go then things like that there were there were some i think 14 questions uh, they're all philosophical questions and the buddha kept quiet and when he was asked that uh, is there some reality after death you know and the buddha said have i said that and the monk who asked said oh so there's nothing after that have i said that but then it has to be one of the two it 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 has to be that something continues or something does not continue after death or after enlightenment whatever after nirvana and then uh, the, the all the other teachers teach this either this or that what do you um, you teach and the buddha said what the tathagata teaches is you know he said that supposing the person was hit by an arrow and uh, if you go to help him and the person says wait wait before you help me uh, help me tell me what material the arrow is made of who is the one who shot the arrow what caste does that person belong to 
what would you say to this person? You'd, you'd think that this person is crazy. The, the, the monk replied, I would think he's mad. He would die before you, you answer these questions. You know? First he needs help. And the Buddha replied precisely. The Tathagata teaches that there is suffering. There is a cause of suffering. There is a solution to suffering. Freedom from suffering called Nirvana. And there is a way of reaching it. But that left those philosophical questions unanswered. Now, why did he not answer those questions? And Nagarjuna takes up, uh, or if not Nagarjuna, at least T.R.V. Murthy, <laughs> he takes it up and says, see, one reason could be, maybe Buddha didn't know. He was kind of dumb. <laughs> no, that couldn't be, because he had studied all the available philosophies at that time, and gone out and practiced, and sought out the most revered masters of his time, and studied with them, and practiced with them. So it's, it's impossible that he did not know the variety of answers on offer at that time. The second thing could be that um, it was not practical. That's, that's how most people take it. It's in practical spirituality, you have to first you know, practice and become enlightened. There's no use going into those philosophical wrangles. It's hair splitting. It's not uh, edifying spiritually or uh, ethically, morally edifying. So don't go into all that. That could be. And many people think that's, that was the point that the Buddha was making with his silence. But there could be a third alternative. A third alternative is, maybe silence is the right answer to these questions. And so Nagarjuna's philosophy of emptiness is based on that. That if you could give a philosophical answer, um, it would be wrong. It would be ultimately contradictory. It would, be, um, it would lead to absurdity if you follow it through. Uh, it would be self-contradictory. It would fall apart upon examination. That doesn't mean that there is no ultimate truth. But it could be that the ultimate truth is beyond language. It could be that the ultimate truth is beyond conception, beyond conceptualizing. Maybe that's what the Buddha was aiming at. And Nagarjuna's whole development of Buddhist philosophy, he came about 500 years after the Buddha, so nearly 2,000 years ago, uh, is based on this premise. Seems to be like that. So emptiness. Now it didn't make, I mean, I, I studied and kept on reading, but it really didn't come together for me. It, it wasn't all that clear to me. It seemed, it's very important in Buddhism. The term emptiness has been used by the Buddha himself and every Buddhist philosopher and teacher since, till, till today. So you can imagine there is a lot of uh, uh, literature on nothing. Uh, emptiness, if, I'm joking, emptiness is not nothing. But still, if you take it as nothing, they have said a lot about nothing. And it's very, you can see, it's very subtle, it's deeply argued, it's not al always very consistent. Uh, so, what does it all mean? What, what use is it? And wh how does it help us in our spiritual life? And finally, from my perspective, I'm not a Buddhist, I'm not a Tibetan Buddhist or a Buddhist of any, any shade or coloring, but from my perspective as a Vedantist, uh, how would it relate to me? How would it relate to Advaita Vedanta special? specifically, and to Hinduism in general. So these are the big issues, big questions we're going to delve into in the next 45 minutes. <laughs> it's a long, long period to cover, 2,000 years. <laughs> what helped, um, again, was a few years ago, I, I took two courses at the Harvard Divinity School, one under Professor Jay Garfield. He was teaching Indo-Tibetan Madhyamaka Buddhism, the philosophy of Nagarjuna and his followers, as it was developed in India and later on in Tibet. About six, seven hundred years of development in India and about seven or eight hundred, seven hundred years of development in Tibet. Um, so he was te te teaching a course on that. And I was lucky enough to join that course. It really helped me enrich my understanding of, of nothing, <laughs> uh, on emptiness. And there was another course in Emerson Hall, the philosophy department at Harvard, by Professor Parimal Patil, where he was teaching um, classical um, Indian Buddhism, classical Indian Buddhist philosophy. So the, all the Buddhist philosophy which was done in India in Sanskrit, so a period of about approximately a thousand years, starting about nearly um, 400, 500 years after the Buddha, when major philosophical activity started to be done in Sanskrit, uh, in Buddhism, and ending with the destruction of the Nalanda University and all of that. So those two courses helped, but still I didn't get a clear idea about this emptiness. The big picture didn't quite emerge 
I mean, I had a lot of information now, a lot of information. And I had read many, many books, thanks to Professor Garfield especially. He is known for his super dense readings. And so every week you had to read 300 or 400 pages. And you can imagine it was fascinating and also very difficult because um, these texts, what a journey. They had traveled from ancient India, from these great monasteries, uh, in, monastery universities of Nalanda, written nearly 2,000 years ago in India, several hundred years in India, development in India. Then they migrated to Tibet. These texts, they were taken by monks to Tibet. And they were translated from Sanskrit to Tibetan. And the Tibetans worked on it. They commented on it, developed it for six, seven, eight hundred years more. And then um, Harvard University in the 23rd, uh, 21st uh, century, originally in uh, Sanskrit, philosophical Sanskrit, to philosophical Tibetan, to almost incomprehensible English. <laughs> And you have to read 300 pages of that every week. So I had a lot of information, but still was not very clear. Um, until, until very recently, a book came to my hands. It's called Progressive Stages of Meditation on Emptiness. It sounds a little bland, but it's a really remarkable little book. Not so well known, but it's by a Tibetan master, uh, Kenpo Sultrim Gyantso Rinpoche. I heard from um, a Tibetan Buddhist scholar and practitioner here in the United States, Andrew Holdcheck, uh, who's a friend. He told me that the Rinpoche is, is in his last days now. He is at the war to pass, but he has left behind these treasures, especially this one, this little book, Progressive Stages of Meditation on Emptiness. And when I read that, for the first time, it all came together for me. Uh, what is emptiness? What is meant by emptiness? What is the deeper and deeper understanding of emptiness? And how do you apply it in your spiritual life? So, what he has said in that book, I'm just going to present before you. And I'm going to summarize. It's a little book, but it's very dense. So I'm going to summarize this for us here. That's going to be the subject, the uh, agenda for this evening. Nothing. Just nothing. There's no emptiness. It's just <laughs> emptiness. Um... So what the Rinpoche has done is, in this book, he takes up the concept of emptiness as it is found, as it is developed in Buddhist philosophy over the ages, and divides it into five stages. So five stages. He is very methodical. Um, the f first, in each stage, he tells us what is the understanding of emptiness, and how, you do, how do you meditate upon it, and what benefit you get, up, get from it. And then goes deeper and deeper until he reaches what he considers to be the final stage. Now, before I launch into this, just uh, flag, I'd like to flag this. This is his, his take on it. And remember, he's a Tibetan uh, Buddhist monk. So there are many, many shades, many, many sects of Buddhism. Very clearly uh, and reasonably, there would, would be many others who might not agree with this take. But it helped me. And you'll see it's a pretty elegant way of tying together a huge amount of uh, philosophy of nearly 2,000 years, you know. So, so just having, keeping that in the background. It's not the final word. Uh, I'm not claiming it is. I'm sure the Rinpoche himself doesn't claim it's the final word. But I found it very, very helpful. And especially from our perspective as non-dualists, Advaitins, as Hindus also. All right, here goes. Here, what's the phrase? Here goes nothing? <laughs> so good. Peculiarly apt. The first stage, according to the Rinpoche, is um, what he calls the Shravaka stage. The Shravaka stage, it's an entry into the concept of non-dualism. Um, we might be more familiar with this as Theravada Buddhism. The Buddhism which you see prevalent in Sri Lanka, in Southeast Asia, um, a different... Uh, uh, it, it's quite widespread, and it's a vast f uh, philosophy in itself, very rich. And their conception of emptiness is this. It can be described as emptiness of self. What the, uh, the Shravaka way, what, does it, what it says is that we think we exist, that I, I am a self. Here I am embodied as a self, I am this person, and I exist somehow in this body and mind. And the understanding in general, actually throughout Buddhism, is that this is a root cause of all our problems. I am this limited being apart from others and I exist independently by myself and I must take care of I, me, myself. 
all nice things must come to this. Why? Because I am this. Here, I am somewhere here. And uh, everything must be made to, you know, gratify me. People and places and food and, you know, gadgets and activities and everything for, for me. And that seems to be um, axiomatic. We don't even question it. Of course, I want to be happy. And who is this I? We don't question it. So the Theravadins launch upon this questioning and what they're going to end up is this, what we consider as the most important thing is empty. There's n if you search for it, you won't find it. The most important thing in our lives, whether we, we might be too shy to admit it, that I, me, myself, I'm the most important thing, but we behave, we think that way, we behave that way. Self. And if you search for it, you won't find anything. That's the emptiness of self. How so? And just by the way, Sri Ramakrishna. Um, there is a very interesting little book, The Teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. In English, it's translated as The Words of the Master. Sri Ramakrishna Upadesha in Bengali. It was collected by Swami Brahmananda, um, a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, the first president of our order, whom Sri Ramakrishna considered his spiritual son. He was not uh, one for writing books or giving lectures, but he did write this book. And it's a, compila uh, a compilation of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings, selected, curated by Swami Brahmananda. And the very first teaching, number one, if you search for who am I, he says, Sri Ramakrishna says, if you find out who you are, you'll find God. I'm paraphrasing. If you find out who you are, you'll find God. So the next thing is to find out who you are. And if you, he, <laughs> then he says, if you search for who am I, you won't find anything. I'm translating that. And then he goes on to say something more. If he had stopped here, he would have been a Buddhist or, 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 or a Shravaka Buddhist. He goes on to say a little more. You know, Sri Ramakrishna says, if you investigate, what am I? Am I the hands or the feet or the blood or the flesh or the bones? And you find there is nothing here that corresponds to I. And shar kichu pao jayana, you will never end up with an essence. He says, if you search for I, no essence. You will no find no essential thing here in this body-mind which will correspond to I. Which we have instinctively, we, we feel that we do exist. No, you won't find anything. Of course, if he stopped there, he would have been a perfect Shravaka Buddhist, Theravada Buddhist. But then he, of course, being a Hindu, he goes one step forward and he says, what remains is the self, pure consciousness. He says, Chaitunno, Jathake Tai. Uh, so that's, we'll set that aside. But it's curious, what the Shravaka, the, the Theravada Buddhist says is exactly what Sri Ramakrishna starts, I mean, I mean the Swami Brahmananda at least starts his book on Sri Ramakrishna's teachings with this teaching. So how do they, do, how do they say this? What they, the Theravada Buddhists say is, look at yourself, what we consider to be ourselves, this bundle of body-mind, this personality. And if you analyze this, if you take a close look at this, you will find there are five components here, five components, which is the famous pancha skandha, five aggregates of Buddhism. This is again something common to um, all Buddhist schools, the five aggregates. What are the five aggregates? First of all, the body, the material body. The technical name for that is the rupa skandha, the form, basically. Then the second one would be the feelings, sensations, which we have now, right now. You have, you feel good, or you don't feel good, or you feel sort of mixed and neutral. So Vedana Skanda, the, the, the aggregate, aggregate or heap of feelings, sensations, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Third is um, what is called Samskara Skanda, a mass of tendencies. See, we are all different. What makes us different? We have different personalities, different tendencies, different uh, personality types. So these tendencies which are stored up uh, in our subconscious, you know, likes and dislikes, dispositions, all of these in Sanskrit, they are called samskaras. This is a common idea in many Indian philosophies. So in um, Theravada Buddhism, this is called samskara skandha. Then the fourth one would be uh, what is known as sangya skandha. Um, the Sangya Skanda would be um, the, all the mass of perceptions and thoughts. Uh, so seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, also thinking. Here, mind itself is treated as a sense, a sort of, you know, quote unquote, sixth sense. So thinking, imagining, all of that, 
All our internal first person ex experiences which we are having, all of that is one pillar uh, or one um, aggregate called the Sangya Skanda. And finally, we are all aware, we are all aware, awareness itself. So we have a continuous, you know, flashes of awareness, we are aware, sometimes more, sometimes less. So this awareness which we all experience all the time, this is called the Vijnana Skanda, the aggregate of awareness. So you have five things, five components, the body, the sensations, the predis predispositions, our tendencies, basically our character uh, as it stands right now. And then um, perceptions and thoughts, mental activity and perceptual activity, and awareness. All of these five taken together, this is what is there right now. This is all you can find. If you search for it, this is all you can find. If you, some of you are Advaitins, and you think that reminds me of something, the five sheets of the human personality, you know, the, food, the body, the vital sheet, the mind, the intellect sheet, and the causal sheet. Annamaya, pranamaya, an, uh, manomaya, vijnanamaya, anandamaya. You'll be right. It's pretty similar. It's, um, it's just one way of analyzing this, what is experienced. In all of this, where am I? Clearly not just the body. Because the body has changed so much. It's a mass of flesh and blood and bones like Sri Ramakrishna says. Am I a bone? <laughs> if you put it so bluntly, we would say, no, 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 I'm not a bone. Uh, am I a little bit of blood or a little bit of flesh? Or No, it's all that gooey, sticky, sticky stuff which is inside. Am I any of that? No, we would we'd say that's gross. By the way, all of our books translate the stula sharira in Sanskrit as a gross body in English, which is peculiarly apt. It's, it has a meaning in, uh, in American English nowadays. Gross means that kind of, you know, ew, gross, that kind of gross. And it's gross, pretty gross, and, and we, we really don't identify with that. If you, if, if you push to it, we would say, no, I'm not literally uh, a bone or a bundle of bones. This is a song, by the way, I don't know, somebody pointed out a uh, favorite old American song, it's called Them Bones. Uh, you should look it up in, on YouTube. And somebody showed me, and I really liked it, it's a very Vedantic song. It just, it's a skeleton, it's, it's a song about a skeleton. Living life, you know, that, that's us exactly. It just sees each of us as a skeleton going through life, them bones. <laughs> um, no, we, we, we refuse to say that I am those bones. Similarly, and, and, and many other arguments could be brought up, you know, from babyhood to childhood to teenage. The body has undergone such tremendous changes up to old age and I am still, I feel I am the same person. How can the tremendously changing body and I, the unchanging person, be the same? How can changing and unchanging be the same? It, it's contradictory. And I feel I am unchanging. Common sense tells me I am the same person um, who was the, that little baby, the pictures which your mom insists on embarrassing you with, uh, and I was that kid in school, and that young person. Even law insists you are the same person. Legally, you are the same person. And yet, it can't literally be that body. All right, so it's not the body. Uh, similar things apply for feelings and thoughts, which are even more evanescent, even uh, they are, they are, at least the body has the merit of being pretty solid and right here uh, in your face. But the mind and feelings, they're so smoky, so evanescent, so floating. They're very important to us, but they don't seem very substantial. And if you look, they are also very changing. The, the thoughts and emotions, the ideas that we had as kids, you know, back in grade school, and what you feel like right now, uh, um, very different, except for the kid who's in grade school right there. <laughs> so, uh, it's all, all very different. And yet I feel I'm the same one who thought uh, uh, that all I wanted to ever do was to drive a car, or uh, as Swami Vivekananda said, he wanted to be a, a, a bus conductor or some, a, a horse carriage driver or something like that. And so as a kid, you, you wanted to do that. But I'm the same person. Thoughts have changed so much. My wants, my understanding of the world, my knowledge, everything has changed so much. How can I be the thoughts? How can I be the feelings which change moment to moment? Um, Perceptions, continuously changing. And even awareness, you know, it increases and decreases and there, there are flashes of this awareness and in, in deep sleep or in coma or anesthesia, awareness disappears altogether. So I am not any of these, nor I am the, I have a bundle of all of these. We might insist, uh, not so fast Swami, 
I think I'm not any of these, but I'm, a, I'm surely the bundle of all of these. I'm all of these together. But that's not very logical. You know, that bundle is continuously changing. And I don't feel I am changing as, as this individual. The body mind are changing. And uh, this bundle is disparate and very, you know, co composed of many different things which come and go. How can I be that one constant self throughout my life in this ever-changing little bundle? So, when we investigate, we find nothing corresponds to the, um, to the self. This is called the shunyata, the emptiness of the self. This body-mind complex is empty of any essence, empty of any self. Isn't that terrible? No! The Buddhist insists that this is wonderful. You are set free. You are set free from all the narrowness, all the grasping, all the limitedness of being a little um, person forever set against a vast world and competing for existence, competing for resources with everybody else, set off ev against everybody else. No. You are free. Uh, our anger, our greed, our lust, our passion, it all requires a base as a person, as a self. If it's empty inside, who is there to be insulted? Who is there to suffer? Who is there to be anxious about and to be, to be defended and uh, uh, justified? Who? There's nobody there. The house is empty. Uh, some people are disturbed at this and some people, if you're Vedantists and all, you might be disturbed at this. But some people love it. It, just, it gives you a great sense of uh, freedom and, in, and independence and it has a great spiritual benefit. All right. One way of understanding each of the five stages of emptiness, understanding of emptiness, is um, um, the dream example. So in each stage, I will refer back to our dream example. What do I mean by the dream example? Just the way we dream and what we think about dreams. So suppose in a dream you were visiting, uh, you know, uh, in, in the, this beautiful temple, this uh, ocean out there, Santa Barbara on our right, and the hills at the back, and this beautiful temple here. And then you woke up and you saw it was a dream. You thought you were sitting and meditating here. When you wake up, you realize that the one who was sitting and meditating in the temple in the dream wasn't really me. It appeared like that, but it was empty. There's nobody there. This is what the, the Shravaka stage or the Theravada stage wants to say. We want to understand emptiness using our dreams. When we wake up, we admit it was a dream. And the implication is, that I, the person in the dream, was not really there. There was no real person in the dream, and so all the bad things that might have happened, sometimes lots of bad things happen. A lot of anxiety dreams are there. You, you might be being chased by a tiger. That's not so common in Santa Barbara. <laughs> but maybe there is a wildfire coming, and you can't get out of the way, um, which is worse, actually. <laughs> uh, so, and then when you wake up, you realize that person who's anxious about the wildfire and trying to get out of the way, trying to save himself or herself, wasn't there. There was no person there. That's the emptiness of the self. Right now the claim is in our waking stage also, there's no person here. Always remember, Buddhists make a difference between conventional truth and ultimate truth. Ultimately there's no person here. Conventionally you can go on with your life. If you have been going on with your life without a person, a driverless Google car, so you can continue riding that car also. You, you know, it's, just, it's like you're riding this uh, cab and you thought there was a uh, driver in the up front. Suddenly you realize it's a driverless Google car. There's nobody driving. <laughs> but then the driving can go on. There's no problem there at all. Okay. So this is the, uh, the first stage. And there is a whole process of meditation where you um, sit, calm down and relax. And what they call is summon the bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is a combination of uh, wisdom and uh, compassion. You, you generate that and the desire to help all sentient beings go beyond suffering. And then you meditate on the five individually, on the five skandhas, the five aggregates. Pay attention to the body and see that I am nowhere here. Pay attention to the feelings and see that I am nowhere here. Pay attention to the thoughts, perceptions, our uh, some tendencies, some scars. Even the awareness which comes and goes, I, the thing, I is nowhere here. You know, 
then why do I feel? Somebody might ask a question. Why do I feel I exist as a person then? Why at all? The bundle has something to do with it. You're right. You are the entire bundle, but the entire bundle generates an illusion of a separate, independent self. Cut off from everything else, a small self existing somewhere there. Uh, like an essence. There's some essential self here. It feels like that. It's like if you take a flashlight and swing it around rapidly, it will look like a circle of light. But there's no circle of light. It's just a dot of light going round and round fast. <laughs> Similarly, it's the activities of the body, the mind, the sensations, the perceptions, the thoughts, awareness, which generates the feeling of I here. But there's no I. As Sri Ramakrishna himself says, when you inquire, you will find nothing, no essence to the whole thing. It's quite dramatic and quite un-Hindu because <laughs> as Hindus, but also as Christians, Muslims, Jews, we would always feel that there is a, uh, an immortal soul, we have a self. It's a bit, very radical way of thinking, I mean, quite different from the idea of uh, there's somebody in here. You know? All right, now comes the second stage. The because according to the Rinpoche, these are deeper and deeper levels of understanding of nothing, I mean, emptiness. <laughs> and he is not criticizing the earlier, uh, earlier stages, and the previous stages, but they are foundational for understanding, they are all correct, and they are foundational for understanding the more advanced and more subtle uh, stages of emptiness. So the second understanding comes from the second stage comes from a school called the mind-only school. Mind-only school. In Sanskrit, Chittamatra, Vijnanavada, Yogachara, the multiple names for this. This is a very important school of Buddhist philosophy um, in ancient India and also in Tibet. Mind-only school. Before I go into this, into the mind-only school, what um, we need to know something that happens in between. We are moving from one phase of Buddhism to a huge new phase of Buddhism. This is the transition from Theravada to Mahayana. Theravada to Mahayana. Mahayana literally means the greater vehicle. So this is the kind of Buddhism or the kinds of Buddhisms which are popular across Tibet and China and Korea and Japan, some parts of Southeast Asia and a lot of America and Santa Barbara. <laughs> so, Mahayana Buddhism. And among the many differences, uh, by the way, the Mahayana is called the previous stage, which we talked about, the Theravada, the Shravaka, they call them Hinayana, but that's pejorative, that's why we don't use that term. Hinayana means lesser vehicle, the smaller vehicle. We are the bigger vehicle, the SUV, and you are what? Uh, a sedan? <laughs> a Corolla. <laughs> no, we don't do that. Uh, so, uh, the Mahayana, one of the major transitions was the goal of spiritual life. What do you want in spiritual life? And the Theravada, the first stage, the goal was freedom from suffering. That's what the Buddha said. Attain liberation, attain nirvana, and you're free from suffering. Um, and this was called Arhat, the person who has reached enlightenment and continues to live in this body for a while, and when the body falls apart, he's gone, when the, after death. And that's it, liberation, done. He is freed of suffering, he or she is freed of suffering. Now the Mahayanists say that um, our goal should be not only that, that's fine, that's really great, but the goal should be the, the removal of suffering of not only this person, but every person. The removal of suffering of every sentient being. The goal of life should not be Arhat, it should be Buddha. Characteristic of a Buddha is the, he works, the Buddha works to remove the suffering of all sentient beings. So it's not that I'll get uh, enlightenment first. And uh, uh, so when, when we were young brahmacharis, uh, the young novice monks, I still I just remembered in the first few days, uh, very enthusiastic about doing this or that, you know, reading this book, meditating this way, doing this practice and that practice. A senior monk looked at us and said, a nice race you all have set up. Who will get God first? Uh, so, uh, like that, instead of doing that, I might even spend lifetime after lifetime working for the removal of suffering of all sentient beings. So this is the famous Bodhisattva Bhav. 
not only to attain enlightenment and liberation for myself, but the greater vow is to attain enlightenment and liberation for all living beings. Strangely enough, uh, Swami Vivekananda, he uh, has echoed this sentiment. He says, in one place he says, it may be that I shall see fit to give up this body, but I shall not cease to work until he, uh, all beings realize that they are one with God. So, this is the Mahayana shift. And this is crucial to our investigation of emptiness. Why? The criticism from the mind-only school of the earlier understanding of emptiness is this. You have understood the emptiness of yourself. But what about the universe? You haven't said anything about the universe. There is a whole world out there. What is this universe? And according to the Theravada schools, it's a vast wor a mass of whirling matter, a flux of matter whirling, changing continuously. And that's it. It's not important. But what is it actually? And so, in the mind-only school, they will, try, they will show that not only is this body-mind empty of self, there's no self here, self-emptiness, but also the emptiness of the universe. Again, the dream example is good for, to understand this. In the dream example, when you wake up, you realize, oh, I wasn't actually at, this, uh, at the temple. That person, was, there was no such person there. The person is empty. That person in the dream is empty. But it wasn't the temple. It wasn't the ocean. It wasn't the sky or the earth. It was just my mind dreaming all of that stuff. So all the things I saw in the dream, the people, the places, the animals and plants and the events, they were all empty. But what were they actually? The person in the dream and the universe I saw in the dream, they were all the dreaming mind. My mind. And don't look so impressed or puzzled. It's just, an, an, this, just how we all, all of us actually, see dreams. When we wake up from a dream, what do we say? Oh, it was a dream. What does that mean? I wasn't the person really there. And there wasn't really there. And there was no, the places and the things which happened and the people in the dream, none of it was there. It was all dreamt up, imagined in my mind. I was taking a nap. That's all. That's what we think. And so the, um, the Rinpoche uses this dream example to show even the universe is empty. How is this universe empty? It seems the earlier guys were right. There is a bundle of body, mind, sensations and the physical universe. And yes, the self is empty, but the universe is there. Now, what the mind-only school, like the name says, mind-only. Remember, what was there in a dream? The mind. That's all that there was. And it dreamt up the dream world and the dream persons and all. Exactly the same thing is going on in the waking world. According to the mind-only school, this waking world, you and all other people, and we all of us, and all of this right now, not in the dream, right now, here, it's in your mind. It's in our minds. They admit multiple minds. But that's all. Even the body is in the mind. What about the brain? That's also in the mind. <laughs> and the world? That's in the mind. How so? So what they do is, they erase the difference between the mental and the physical. They erase the difference between waking and dreaming. They erase the difference between waking and dreaming. Uh, one great Buddhist master, Dharmakirti, he said, Nilo Taddhiyo Abhedaha. The color blue and the cognition of blue. Your experience of blue in the mind and the color blue. They are indivisible. There is no such thing as a color outside. It's just your experience of blue. If you want to erase the difference between dreaming and waking, you'll have to work very hard. Because we are quite convinced waking is real and dreams are dreams. And these people will ask us, the mind only school will ask us, why do you think the waking is more real than the dream? Multiple arguments. I'll give you some. Then you'll get, get, get a feel of how these people think. Uh, they're mind-only school. So we might argue, for example, why do, you, why do I think this is real and my dreams are not, not real? Because, well, naively, let's say, this is more vivid. Dreams are sort of, you know, smoky, not very clear. Uh, the more you think about it, the more hazy it appears. I really had to work on my therapist's couch to bring up the materials from my dream and tell him what I'm, I'm, or <laughs> I have been dreaming about. But this is real. This is so strong and real. When, when we snap out of a dream and wake up, we feel that was um, 
I experienced it, but it was kind of vague. And this is real, the couch I'm lying down on and the room I'm sitting in, this is really real. So this is vivid, and that was not vivid. This is industrial grade reality, you know? <laughs> and that was kind of some smoky virtual reality or whatever. And um, the mind only school will say, um, but in your dreams, that was not the case. In your dreams, you never felt that this looks kind of dubious, you know, sm smoky. It must be a dream. We never feel that. Generally, we don't. It seems we don't doubt it at all. It seems perfectly all right. It may seem crazy up to you. Wake up, things which happened in your dream. But when you're dreaming, it seems perfectly all right. Not only that, they argue in this way. This is the mind-only school arguments. Um, all right, suppose, take a case. A person who, has, who is maybe suffering from Alzheimer's or Parkinson's and whose waking reality has come, become kind of um, <laughs> shaky, you know. I don't remember things, just what happened just now, a lot of memories have faded, and my eyes don't work too well, my ears don't work too well, I don't hear too well, I don't see too well, everything is smoky, everything is a little um, dull and I can't hear, understand what's going on. My waking world has become pretty vague. But you know, uh, my dreams are very sharp and clear. In that case, would you say the dream has become the waking and the waking is the new dream? <laughs> no, you wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say to the such a person, oh, so now this is your dream and that's your waking reality. You wouldn't say that. So vividness is no criteria for uh, reality. Uh, waking life could be vague and dreams could be sharp and clear. That doesn't make them uh, this uh, real and that false. They are similar that way. We might argue, well, that was not a good argument, but how about this? Uh, it's um, um, permanent. I always wake up into this life. I wish it would be a different life each time. But it isn't. Same problem, same people, same job, uh, same uh, financial situations, same um, uh, social media status. I wake up to that every time. And my dreams are different every time. So the dreams are dreams and this is real. But again, you can see the same logic. The, the mind only people will say, uh, if uh, your dreams, if you had the same dream every time, and your waking life became pretty chaotic. You know, there was a movie, a Hollywood movie, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. So this person has no memory, something like that. Their story was something like that. And so every experience was absolutely new. So the waking world, every time you woke up into this world, it would feel like fresh and new and never seen anything like this before. Wow. And suppose you had the same dream over and over again. So the dream would become continuous and your waking life would become discontinuous. Would that make the waking life a dream and the dream life waking? No, it wouldn't. In that case, continuity is not an argument for making waking life real. Huh. Continuity is not an argument for reality. Then we might argue, I can give you many such arguments, but I'll give you one more and stop. Uh, public. Many people ask this. This is real because, Swami, we are all sharing this. We are all experiencing this together. We all will agree we are in this beautiful temple. We are in, um, uh, um, you know, in, front, in front of the Pacific Ocean. And we are listening to a talk about nothingness and dreams and all such stuff. We all agree to this. But each person's dream is private. And therefore, uh, um, that dream is a per personal, private thing in my head. Each person is separate. But here we are all common. We are sharing a... This seems like a good, good uh, argument. It isn't. It's a very poor argument. Because again in the dream, in your dreams, maybe you're sitting and sharing a cup of coffee in a cafe with uh, some friends, and all your friend, friends will see the same cafe, the same cup of coffee, and uh, the same surroundings. Nobody in your dream tells you, you know, um, you enjoy your tea. I can't see it because it's, it, it's a dream, you know. I can't see anything you're seeing because it's your dream. No, they all share the same uh, public reality in your dream. So, shared reality, virtual reality, for example, could be a shared reality, and yet it wouldn't be true. That's why it's called virtual. So, for all these uh, reasons, the mind-only school, they really scare you. you, know, you begin to see the difference between waking and dreaming beginning to disappear. Um, so, the whole world, our waking world, is also like a dream. It's empty. There are no we think there are, there's a world outside that's empty. It's empty of an external separate reality. The person 
and the objects are all mind and therefore mind only. And therefore when we meditate, we use this you know, to draw our attention from the external world because there is no external world. It's all in the mind. And um, also this person is also in the mind. And then we calm the mind down. They analyze reality into three levels of reality. They say the first level of reality which we have is what we take to be this common reality. They call it parikalpita, imaginary, dream. This what we are living in is a dream, is a virtual reality. You, if you like the movie Matrix, congratulations, you are living in the Matrix. <laughs> and this is a profound old ancient school of uh, Buddhist philosophy, the mind only. They seriously believed this and they practiced it. Um, it's also pretty similar to something called subjective idealism in Western philosophy. There was um, Berkeley, Bishop Berkeley. Uh, is Berkeley named after B Bishop Berkeley? Berkeley University. Yep. So Berkeley here, right in, in near uh, in in California, Northern California. It's uh, so he was a philosopher uh, who got the same idea that it could be all in the mind. Uh, he got it six or seven hundred years after these people uh, <laughs> who dis discussed it threadbare. So, emptiness of self, emptiness of the world. In what sense? It's all mind. Now comes the third uh, stage of, uh, of emptiness, a deeper, even deeper understanding. Uh, this is the school of Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti and a whole series of Tibetan Buddhists down to the present day Dalai Lama and, and all, his, all the monks. Um, this is called the Madhyamaka school. The Madhya, the middle path. And they are the specialists, the, the, the emptiness people. They are the specialists in emptiness. One another name for the school is the emptiness school. Shunyavadi. Uh, Madhyamaka Shunyavadi. They are, the main, main person here is um, Nagarjuna and his disciple, a follower after that, Chandrakirti and some others. And it really took on a life of its own in Tibet. And it's it's the basis of Tibetan Buddhism. The basis of Tibetan Buddhism today is a sort of a synthesis between the emptiness school, the ancient Indian school of emptiness, and also the mind-only school, a kind of synthesis between the two. This is the fundamental core philosophy of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and all the Tibetan masters, include, including the author of this book, which I'm using. So what do they say? They say, you're right, the self is empty. And the universe, you're right, the universe is empty. And the mind, in which all of this is appearing, ah, that is empty too. So what's real? What's not empty? No, everything is empty. Is it mind only? No, mind only is wrong. There's no mind only. That's also empty too. Uh, because of time problems, I'm going to give you the core argument and move on fast. So there are two schools of uh, the emptiness school, uh, two sub-schools called the Swatantrika and the Prasangika. The differences need not bother us here, but I have to mention it because it's really huge in Tibet. They went through about a 700 year of very intense debate, fight. Uh, including some actual combat to <laughs> and debates to and finally the winner is the prasangika there is no real swatantrika school they're all emptiness people uh, anyway i will not go into the technicalities but it's important for them practically for us they are saying the same thing what they are saying is look at the crucial point made by the mind only school it is in the mind all of these things are happening and if you ask what is the mind in the mind, there's the person. In the mind, there's the universe. But what is the mind? According to the mind-only school, the mind is each instant of cogni cognition. You're seeing color. That's one instant of cognition. You're seeing a person. One instant of cognition. You feel bad. That's one instant of cognition. And we have a series of these instants of cognition, each succeeding the earlier one, very fast. And that's our life. Us, uh, I mean, the modern English... Uh, phrase, a stream of consciousness, captures it very well. I mean, it's something, it means something else in literature, but something very similar, what these uh, mind-only school were saying. All our life is a stream of consciousness. Uh, moments of cognition, they call it vijnana. Vijnana, a flash of consciousness. A flash, of, like a flash of light. Each flash of light, each flash of consciousness has within it a knower and a known object. You the knower and the known object. And that's how our life is going on. Now these um, emptiness people, Nagarjuna and his followers, they are hyper-logicians. <laughs> they, they are ex extremely good. They wield the sword of logic and their goal is to cut through illusion. 
that they wield the broom of logic, their goal is to sweep away all concepts. Nagarjuna says, Shunyata Sarva Drishti Nam, the emptiness of all philosophies. The emptiness of all philosophies. And if you say at this moment, just a minute, Mr. Nagarjuna, what about your philosophy? So is it empty or not empty? If you say your philosophy is not empty, then there's at least one philosophy which is not empty. But if you say all philosophies are empty, then your statement that all philosophies are empty is also empty. Right? Nagarjuna has a beautiful comeback to that. He says, if you say anything, any philosophical position, if you take, I will show you that it's empty, logically, and they can show it. But since I do not take any philosophical position, you can't accuse me of the same fault. If you ask me, what's your philosophy? <laughs> then what do you do as a philosopher? Anything you say is wrong. I'm going to show that to you. Sri Ramakrishna, a person who is all inclusive and so har harmonious, in one place he says, everybody thinks his watch is right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Sri Ramakrishna says that. It's, uh, that reminded me of Nagarjuna, the emptiness of all philosophies. And there's a saying that a person wearing two watches is never sure of the time. <laughs> Before our internet age. Now everybody is on, on, on the same time here. Yeah. All right. So what would be Nagarjuna's and um, the emptiness people? What would be their response to the mind-only people? Their response is this. One of the instruments, they have a whole, they're very forensic. They have a whole range of scary medical equipment, logical medical equipment to cut things apart. So there's one of the instruments they have, they take it out, and you can see the, all the other philosophers shaking in their boots or sandals, is called the single or many. Um, they say, any entity you take up, like a hand, take a hand or fist, is it one or many? Is it a single thing or is it composed? Does it have parts? And there's no, no third alternative. Either a thing is uncompounded, single, simple, one, or it looks one but it has many parts. Now. Uh, if you uh, examine this hand, you will find it has parts. And if you open it, the fist, it has five fingers and so on. Where is the fist? It's not there anymore. Where is the fist apart from the fingers and the hand? The apart from the parts, where is the entity you are talking about? It's not there. It's disappeared. It's empty. So, yeah, yeah, but the fingers are there. But if you examine the fingers, they also have parts. All right, but at least the fundamental, uh, the um, particles of material nature, they have to exist. And Nagarjuna would say, yes, but are they single or many? Um, single or compounded? If they have parts, if, if each atom, and the ancient Indians had uh, people with atomic theory, the Vaisheshikas, the first atomists in the world, who said that the smallest particle in the universe is indivisible. It cannot be divided into further parts. Nagarjuna would say, supposing um, the thing cannot be divided into further parts. So it would have no parts at all. It would have no up, down, left, right, whatever, no sides to it. Uh, it, uh, it has no parts after all. You say, okay, so what's the problem? But with these partless particles, how would you come into a build up a universe? Because you remember our geometry which we learned, a dot is something that has uh, a point, is something that has no length, no breadth. Uh, so if a part partless particle is there, how would two partless particles join? And where would they join? Because there's no part in which they can join. And if two particles cannot join, how would you form a universe with these partless particles? So single, it can't be. We say, all right, but atom has parts, you know. All right, then Nagarjuna would say, if it has parts, what is the atom apart from its parts? Nothing, it's empty. <laughs> so then what is the reality, we ask? And they'd say it's emptiness all the way down. <laughs> Professor Garfield told me once that if, you, if you're reading these people, if you feel that you're falling into a bottomless well, you've got it right. <laughs> All right, we'll leave the emptiness people at this point. We'll move on to the last stage, the fifth stage. Fifth, if you're keeping track, the first, the Shravaka stage, emptiness of self. Second, the mind-only um, philosophy which says emptiness of self and emptiness of the world. It's all mind. The third and the fourth are the Madhyamaka, emptiness schools, both of which they say there is, even the mind is empty. Why? See, apply the same, same philosophy. You said mind is an instant of cognition. That instant has parts or no parts? If it's an instant, if it's an experience, it needs at least a beginning and an experience and an end of that experience, at least three moments. Right? You're having experiences and you mind-only people say these are flashes of mind. These flashes of mind, do they have parts? Do they have duration or not? 
if they have, if they are experiences, there must be a beginning to that experience. You all admit it. And there must be at least one moment of experience. And there must be a moment in which that experience comes to an end. That's already three moments. Then what is this flash of existence apart from the three moments? Nothing. Empty. So this is what they do to the mind-only school. Take it apart. Now comes the final school, which um, Rinpoche calls the Shentong school, and sort of the point of the whole talk. This is an, a not a well-known school, even among Tibetan Buddhists. Because most Tibetan Buddhists, uh, including the Dalai Lama and all the followers, most of them, especially the Geluk monks, they would stop with the Prasangika Madhyamaka school. That is the, the emptiness school. One variety of the emptiness school. This, this third, the fifth one, the Shentong school, the school of, if you literally translate it, it means other emptiness. Anyway, what they say is, you're all right, but the first, self-emptiness is right, all is mine, that's also good. A deeper understanding is all these are concepts and you have to cut them down and you're right, they're all empty. However, when you reach this emptiness, it's not nothing, right? If it was nothing, how could it appear as samsara? And how could it, more importantly, appear as nirvana, yeah. freedom? And you yourself, Nagarjuna, so if, you, if you, those who have read Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna says that we are not nihilists. We are not saying that the ultimate reality is nothing. Oh, so it is something. Oh, no, we are not saying that either. So that's where they are. And so the, these Shentong people, they catch you there. They say that, so you yourself admit it's not nothing. And yes, it's not something either. It is that in which all the somethings and the nothings appear and disappear. All your samsara appears. And when you recognize it for what it is, then the same thing appears as nirvana. This emptiness, according to the Shentong school, is a luminous emptiness. Uh, it is empty. There is, no, there is no reality to anything external or internal. But that emptiness is irradiated with, is all through and through consciousness, is awareness. Uh, they, they give a beautiful example of the sky like that, you know, the vast blue sky. It's empty sky, but it's also blazing blue or, you know, luminous sky. And that is the reality. That, when not recognized as it is, gives, appears to all of us, we all appear there as samsara. When it is recognized as, as it is, the same thing appears as nirvana. Now this emptiness and luminosity, to me at least, immediately it, it uh, evoked sat and chit, uh, isness and awareness. Pure being and pure emptiness are obverse and reverse of the same, uh, same coin. Pure being and pure emptiness. And the moment they add luminosity, consciousness to it, but there you have, I mean, to me it speaks of um, at least the essence of Advaita Vedanta, non-dual Vedanta, existence, awareness. I'll leave you with just one more point. Oh, the real, their real attack on the emptiness people, the hyperlogicians, these Shentong pe people, they turn, they pull the carpet out from their feet, under their feet. They accuse the uh, emptiness people of the same fault which the emptiness people accuse everybody else of. That everybody, they say everybody else is trapped in concepts. And we are here to remove, to help you, to cut down all illusion, to take a broom of logic and sweep away all your concepts. They call it conceptual elaboration. Prapancha means conceptual elaboration for the uh, emptiness school. Now the Shentong school comes in and says, ah, yes, you do a good job, my brother. I agree with everything you say. Everything is empty. However, <laughs> there is a little problem with your approach. What is that? Uh, you should tell me what is your, uh, your view. I'm going to cut it down because I'm ready with my... And the Shentong school says, precisely. You are left with one last concept which you are blind to. The concept of removing all concepts. And he points you back to Nagarjuna's warning in the Mula Madhyamaka Karika. He says, Nagarjuna says, he says, Shunyata, emptiness is the medicine for all ills. For all your conceptual ills, con confusions, emptiness will destroy that and set you free. However, he warns, if you take emptiness as the reality, then there is no help for you. <laughs> he says, el emptiness will help everybody to set them free from suffering, except the one who takes emptiness as the reality. Then for that person, no, no escape is there. 
and he gives the example yatha sarpo durgrihita this is nagarjuna's own, own language as a snake mishandled if you catch a snake a poisonous snake by the wrong end you are in serious trouble <laughs> and he says my friend the emptiness master you have caught your own emptiness by the wrong wrong end and i am here to set you free from your emptiness uh, so you well, your problem is you are so fond of your conceptual app apparatus your sword of logic you are ready to cut down everything after you have cut down everything and attained the reality you are now ab about to cut down the reality it's a boat you have reached the other shore i'm here to tell you let go of the boat uh, you are still sitting in the boat <laughs> Uh, let go of the boat of your logic and see the reality, enjoy it, and you have attained nirvana. The dream example, They're very beautiful. In the uh, mind-only school, you realize you and the world are dreams, the mind is reality. In the emptiness school, you realize that the mind cannot exist without the dream. According to the emptiness school, without the dream, without waking, is there a mind? No, mind also doesn't exist. There, he gives the example of two sheaves of hay leaning against each other. If you remove one, the other will fall. Uh, if there is no waking, no dreaming, remove the waking and dreaming, mind itself disappears. Uh, you say, oh, what about deep sleep and all that? That's all your back calculation. There's nothing there. Now, uh, the, uh, the Shentong school comes and says, uses the same dream example and says, once you have recognized that it's a dream, there can be lucid dreaming. Uh -huh. uh, so, there can be a dream without knowing it's a dream, you're trapped in samsara. And there can be a lucid dreaming, you know it's a dream, and you can let the dream go on, but you're free of it because you know it's a dream. Similarly, what nirvana is, this goes on, but you know what it is, that luminous emptiness, and you're free of it. So this is five stages of uh, investigation into emptiness. Um, can I take one more minute? There's one thing I wanted to share here, very beautiful. The emptiness people come back at the Shentong school. By the way, the Shentong school is not well known because it was suppressed in Tibet. There's a Jonang mon monastery where this was practiced and the books were there. The monastery was destroyed, the books were burnt. Um, some of them still practice it, uh, but it was sort of absorbed back into the Madhyamaka school. It's in a few hundred years ago in ancient Tibet, in medieval Tibet. That's why it's not so well known, but there are some, some practitioners still. Um, the last point I want to make here is the emptiness people ask these shentong, that this final fifth stage. All right, um, I'm not saying you're wrong, because I'm not going to say anything at all. I'm not saying you're wrong, but why say it? My objection is to saying it. And here's a beautiful answer by the shentong school. Why do you need to state in words this highest truth of emptiness? Why? Five reasons they gave. One is, for those who are so de self-deprecating, that they feel that they can never attain enlightenment. You need to tell them, your nature is the Buddha nature. You are pure consciousness, this empty luminosity is your nature right here, right now. They need to know this. Second, there are those who are so proud that they think themselves enlightened and superior to all others. They need to be told, this emptiness, clear luminosity, is the nature of all beings, all the Buddhas, down to a little grasshopper. Everybody shares in this, this uh, reality, whether they are enlightened or not, Buddhists or not, um, whether they are practicing or not, the wor most worldly people, the smallest of animals and creatures, and the Buddha, they all are equally this clear luminosity. That's why it needs to be told, to prevent spiritual pride. Third is that uh, there are those who struggle, if you don't tell them the truth, they will take this, what is you called defilements, bodily and mental defilements to be the only reality we have. Endlessly struggling against it and never quite overcoming it. Fourth is, the reason we, we need to tell it is for you emptiness guys. Otherwise you'll be struck, stru uh, stuck in your loop of logic in order to, in order to <laughs> snap you out of it into the reality. And the last reason is beautiful. For compassion and service. Because we are all one clear luminosity and therefore there is compassion for all manifestations of this luminosity and into service. And here I find an amazing similarity between this Shentong formulation of emptiness and the Vivekananda's formulation of Advaita Vedanta, Vijnana Vedanta. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu.
not too bad. I was three minutes over time. <laughs> <laughs>